Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. But if this population is gone, then the natural population, the wild population, is gone. And we don't have it anymore in Texas. But see, we didn't have all that stuff back then. They really make history come alive for these kids, and it was really touching to see how excited the kids were to learn about our Buffalo Soldiers and to learn about Texas history. So we're giving them a sanctuary. We're restoring them into the park, giving them a sanctuary where they can be prairie dogs. In far west Texas, amongst the rocky and rough terrain, lies the Trans-Pecos. In this dry Chihuahuan desert region, aquatic life lives on in rivers, creeks, and cienegas. Many of these fish are only found here in the desert, adapted to survive in these harsh conditions. Because of lack of water and loss of habitat, we have a lot of fish in West Texas that are threatened. One fish in particular, the Pecos pupfish, is in serious trouble. With habitat fragmentation, loss of water, and now a new threat, hybridization, this desert dweller's existence is on the brink. Wow, this has really changed. Well, wow. I think our site is right down there. Ken Saunders has been working out here in West Texas for 27 years. And today he's out to check on the Pecos pupfish. So it looks like we have a big platform rig that's already pumping. We got this new one going in right here and our creek's running right in between it. Four or five years ago when we started working here, we'd come out here and all you could see was the creek. You can sit here and count rig after rig after rig after rig after rig. It's just really changed the landscape a lot. So we have about three miles of creek left in the whole state of Texas that has the Pecos pupfish in it. We are hoping they're still there, and so we're gonna be taking DNA samples and shortly we'll be able to know whether we still have that fish here or not. The Pecos pupfish is just one of 24 similar small fish that are now threatened or endangered here in West Texas. So why should we care about these little fish? They're kind of the first to go. If they go, what's next? It's part of the natural system. And every time we lose part of our natural system, we lose part of us. It's, it's our world. It's, it, if we don't take care of it, what are we going to have left? The historic home for the Pecos pupfish in Texas was the Pecos River, beginning along the New Mexico border, flowing southeast all the way to the Rio Grande. Now all the pupfish has left is a small tributary up near Pecos, Texas. Look at all those babies right there. Those are a bunch of juveniles right there. That's good. But everything's not good here in this creek. 
These larger fish you can see here are Gulf killifish that were introduced. They're normally in the estuaries along the Gulf Coast. Oh, got a big one. Yep. Gulf killifish. Gulf killifish. Look at that big old fat belly too. Gee, I wonder what he's been eating. The Gulf killifish is the top predator to all these Pecos pupfish. You can see they get pretty big compared to our pupfish. That's a baby pupfish right there. Obviously this fish can eat that fish and we're finding that they do. Okay. To help the pupfish, biologists do a quarterly fish count of sorts. We, uh, we go in and we try to do some seine hauls. Twist in the net right there, there we go. But once we actually uh, drag the seine through the water, we bring it up to the shore. And lift. Oh man, Ooh look at all those fish. And we pick out all the fish from the net, identifying which species we have, how many of each species. 10 juveniles. 15 juvies, five adults. 10 adults, two juvies. So we're trying to see how many adults we have, how many juveniles we have, so we can try and establish trends. That right there is a big adult pupfish. Female, looks like she's full of eggs. The science we're doing is really important because it gives us an idea of how the population of fish are doing. Are they declining? We wouldn't know that if we didn't come out here quarterly throughout the year to monitor the population. The biggest threat to the pupfish is another introduced minnow that's kind of like an evil twin. We have an introduced fish from the Gulf Coast called the sheep's head minnow. Very, very similar to the pupfish and they interbreed. When they do, they create hybrids that are not pure pupfish. In Texas, this is the last natural stronghold where the Pecos pupfish is still pure. It has hybridized itself and now you can't find them anymore. They keep coming out. Yep. That's just one more problem these little guys are facing in this creek. While biologists look for solutions to the non-native species here, they're also working with landowners in the Pecos region to find creeks that can serve as a new home. Until then, they're partnering with Texas zoos, so the pupfish doesn't go extinct. See? Look, you see that water? Oh, I see them now. I see what we're looking for. Here at the Fort Worth Zoo, there is a captive breeding program underway. This is basically a refuge if something happens to the natural population out in Pecos. This man-made nursery ensures that the Pecos pupfish will live on. We have a couple different age groups. Um, we've got some young fry all the way up to adults and juveniles in between. In the collection, it's probably about 250 right now. Through that effort, we've been able to ensure that this fish does not go extinct if something happens to its remaining habitat. We don't want to see these fish go endangered. It would be a big loss if it were to disappear. I hate to say it, but a lot of times our job is documenting extinction. Mike, we're going to start with number 60. To see if extinction is upon us here and now, and the fish have indeed hybridized, some molecular biology is about to begin. So we're going to be taking DNA samples, and shortly we'll be able to know whether we still have that fish here or not. But if this population is gone, then the natural population, the wild population, is gone. And we don't have it anymore in Texas. As for this creek and the pupfish, it's no doubt a struggle. But these biologists provide hope. With all the, the work that we're doing, the monitoring, we hope that it's having a, a benefit to the species. You know, we're going to continue fighting the good fight. When we came in January, we caught less than 10 or 12 total in all of our sampling. Oh, we, yeah. <laughs> so for us to be able to drag two seine hauls and literally catch hundreds of juveniles, and that's a good thing. We just hope they're pure. If they're pure, then we still have a very healthy population. <laughs> <laughs>
it's great to go into it and find so many numbers and see that it's still there, that it's persisting and there is in fact pupfish and there's a lot of reproduction going on, which is a good sign. The reason I'm out here and the reason I do this, even though it's at times very disheartening to see what's happening, is because if we don't fight the battles, we won't win any at all. Through our efforts, we may be able to keep some fish alive. It's not for me to decide to throw my hands up. My job is to continue working as hard as I can to protect these fishes and these natural habitats uh, for future generations. And that's why we do what we do. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. Hi, I'm Steve Hall, Hunter Education Coordinator with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And today we're going to cover tree stand safety tips. Prior to using a tree stand, you want to make sure that all the equipment's in good working order. Number one, are the bolts and nuts tight? Uh, two, are the lines in good shape? And three, are the straps uh, weathered or are they in good shape? Did you know that the number one cause of hunting injury and fatality in North America is falls from tree stands? And there's three simple rules to prevent those falls. One, use a good climbing system. Two, a harness while you're in the stand. And three, a haul line to haul up your equipment and lower it back down to the ground. Now when you're climbing a tree stand, that's when the most accidents occur. You want to make sure you have three points of contact while you're climbing on a ladder or into a stand. And you also want to step down onto the platform of that stand uh, before you strap yourself in, in terms of the tree and the harness. Now when our bow hunter is in the stand, he wants to make sure that the tether to the tree is nice and taut. If he does happen to fall off the platform, this will keep his legs near the platform so he can simply step right back on. Today's harnesses are designed with comfort in mind. These vest style harnesses still maintain the four points of contact with the shoulders and the thighs but they're easy to put on and take off. Now we want you to have fun outdoors, but we want you to be safe. And if you follow these tree stand safety tips, you'll enjoy many hunting seasons to come. We're in the middle of our prairie dog town right now. It's part of our big process of, of restoring the park back to what it would have looked like prior to European settlement. Historically, prairie dogs were just totally abundant in, in Texas and the entire Southwest. But they have been reduced to about 2% of the original habitat. So we're giving them a sanctuary. We're restoring them into the park, giving them a sanctuary where they can be prayed on. Are all these burrows that they uh, make, are they all interconnected? You know, many people think that all of the prairie dog burrows are all connected to each other within the town, but they're actually just connected within the cotteries. And cotteries are the family of prairie dogs. They're usually made up of one male and maybe four or five females. See the guy just looking over the edge, this one right over here? He hadn't quite figured us out yet. Yeah. <laughs> You can see the prairie dogs, you can see them actively uh, participating in the ecosystem. You know, the bison wander through here. And then the people can walk right around here and watch this all happening at the same time. Look, there's two babies. Oh, look. 
See the two babies coming out of the hole? Yeah. <laughs> Now the pups are born three months ago or so. We've got a few of them already popping up. Now we got a bunch of little babies running around. It's really neat to see. Not that one, that one. Though. Our goal here at the park is to restore it to what it would have looked like 300 years ago. Thereby giving the people that come, the visitors, the opportunity to see wildlife in a natural setting. We are restoring an indigenous wildlife to its native habitat. This is its historic home. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Whitney Bishop is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. I'm Whitney Bishop. I've been a producer on the show for about seven years. One of my favorite stories is the Buffalo Soldier story. But see, we didn't have all that stuff back then. I got to see how engaged the kids were when uh, interacting with these men and these women. And at one point, I almost got kind of teary-eyed just to see how excited the kids were. They didn't have toothpaste back then. Teaching history to kids is hard, and they really make history come alive for these kids. And it was really touching to see how excited the kids were to learn about our Buffalo Soldiers and to learn about Texas history. I'm Devontae Hill, and I'm 22 years old. I just graduated from college, you know, just looking for an opportunity to kind of get out before I start grinding in a regular job. What I really want to be is a storyteller. Show people things that maybe they haven't seen before. Everyone has a story. When you see things on TV about, you know, outdoors and things like that, all you really see is a, a, a certain type of demographic. You kind of get raised thinking that, okay, these things are not really for me. And whether that's making documentaries, whoa, chill out. Yeah, I'm gonna get my mom. You know, I just want to show people things that maybe they haven't seen before, give them a different reality. Yeah, that was pretty good. I was a state park ambassador that got exposed to the Buffalo Soldier Program. I'm always open to new experiences. Oh. All right, we'll take your picture. I don't have too much experience with kids besides my cousins, and so they'll be interesting dealing with little people. <laughs> Salute. The Buffalo Soldiers were created in 1866 to assist and protect the settlement as it continued to move further out west. What we have here today, guys, are the 10 essentials of outdoor living. These were the first black professional men in the U.S. Army. And they got their name from the Indians. When the Native Americans saw the Buffalo Soldier, he wasn't used to seeing a man of this skin color in the wool uniform. So the only thing the Indian could do at that point is compare this new soldier to something he knew out on the frontier. And that something on the frontier just happened to be the buffalo. They had a reputation of being fierce fighters, not backing down. Like a buffalo come running right through that right now, he wouldn't run around you or jump over, he'll run right through everybody. Yes, sir. Texas Parks and Wildlife started the Buffalo Soldiers program to preserve the cultural history. We're about to go out on a scouting mission. And to connect people with the outdoors, get connected with the state park resource. What are these that he's drawn? When yep. a participant comes to see the Buffalo Soldiers, about face. they are able to about learn about uh, what they did face. on the frontier, how they camped, how they cooked. That's hard, Tech. We use the Buffalo Soldiers' rich heritage and history to connect urban audiences who are not currently connected to their state park, to get them outside. Get them outside throwing a baseball. Get them outside walking the trail. Water. To get them enjoying what's in their own backyard. All the landmarks that we saw, and we're gonna make a list of them, and then we're gonna make a map together. The Buffalo Soldier Program depends heavily on its volunteers. Sergeant says, point to the lake. When you're thrown into this situation, especially when you get to put on their uniform, you, you feel a connection automatically. Yeah. 
They accomplished so many things, building roads, putting up telegraph lines, mapping out areas so they knew where watering holes were. Buffalo Soldiers were also some of the first professional mountain bikers. The Iron Riders blazed the trail of off-road biking for the country. The women that supported the Buffalo Soldiers were strong, pioneering women. They would keep records about what happened in town. The text messages that people sent today started a long time ago with the Buffalo Soldiers as they were working on the frontier stringing up telegraph poles. They were really pioneering this land that we now call America. Come on up here, because you're going to be batting next. There you go. You did good job. Oh, good job. The kids that we interact with, I hope that they leave with a sense of pride, with a sense of wonder, with a sense of curiosity. You don't need all this fancy equipment to play. So that they have a better understanding of not only the Buffalo Soldiers, but also where they come from. Good afternoon, how y'all doing? Black history is not taught in schools anymore. They don't talk about the kings in Africa. They don't, they don't do that anymore. We fought just like the Buffalo, just as brave, just as strong as the Buffalo. A lot of our inner city kids have problems because they don't understand the history. These Buffalo soldiers were from an era where they created their own company with a high level of expectations, requirements, and it produced a lot of dignity. And if you didn't want to go outside and work, what do you think they said? Just do it, exactly. I'm just asking these kids to just go and do and be the best. And Buffalo Soldiers were some of the best. With segregation around, with these men combined into units of just other black men, going into settlements and towns where tensions were high, says a lot about their character and their spirit. As we all know, the Native Americans were pushed off their lands by the U.S. government. Buffalo Soldiers were a part of that mission, but at the same time, they were also trying to prove themselves to the U.S. government, to prove that they were more than three quarters of a person, of a man. So both of these groups were trying to show the leading power of the U.S. government that they are both human. Anytime you, you listen to a story of people who have been put into really bad situations and still was able to do amazing things, that, that definitely has a sense of pride. Maybe I had a Buffalo Soldier in my family line at some point in time. That's really cool when you really think about it. You gotta put a little bit more muscle in that one, man. Come on now. This whole experience has just been one of those life-changing moments. Try to get that one. I've never really done anything like this before. I never really did anything with kids before. And so there was a lot of firsts for me. But it definitely got me a lot more comfortable with you know, sharing history with people. Yeah, that's a good one. A lot more comfortable kind of getting outside my box and yeah. kind of exploring something new and something different. All of them represent fish that you can catch here in Texas. And learning. Stand by. Five, four, three, two. Coming up tonight at 10, a gruesome discovery. I got a job. Hopefully this is the first step to me continuing my training and, and practice at being a storyteller. And from there, we're going to go to camera three, back to two position. I see myself traveling through the beautiful state of Texas, telling stories about uh, a lot of the history here, along with some of the groups that are, are doing some great things. Who said it? Come here. <laughs> and this is part of my story.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.